From KPFK Pacifica Radio, this is Rising Up with Sonali, and I'm your host, Sonali Kolhatkar. You can watch this program on Free Speech TV and listen to it on Pacifica Radio stations and affiliates nationwide. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi's decision to revoke the semi-autonomous rule of its northernmost state of Kashmir has been met with widespread denunciation. Kashmir has been at the center of long simmering tensions and even wars between India and Pakistan for decades, going all the way back to the end of British colonization. But Modi's right-wing Hindu nationalist government has inflamed tensions at a time when both India and Pakistan are nuclear-armed states. While Indian troops have long occupied the majority Muslim state of Kashmir, thousands more troops have been sent to quell anger and enforce a curfew. My guest is Vokas Syed, National Coordinator for the North American Indian Muslim Association and the California State Coordinator for ICNA Council for Social Justice. Welcome to the program, Vokas. Thank you for having me here, Sonali. So let's first um, put the uh, issue of Kashmir into historical context, because those who support Modi might simply say to people unfamiliar with the situation, if Kashmir is indeed a state in India, uh, what's the problem with allowing the Indian central government to rule over it like it rules over all other states? Um, Can you give us a, a brief historical framework for why Modi's action is so problematic? One of the most important bases that this statement uh, ignores is the agreement in 1948 with the people of Kashmiri, uh, the people of Kashmir and the leadership of Kashmir that was to allow Kashmir to have a relationship with India based on autonomy. It was agreed by the Indian government to have a prime minister Uh, in Kashmir, and uh, the defense and foreign policy would be handled by India. And this agreement was uh, signed and ratified by Pakistan, by India, by the people of Kashmir at that time. And this was, this agreement is completely ignored. What else is also ignored when saying that Kashmir is an integral part of India is the United nations resolutions. There are not one, not two, but three separate resolutions which call for self-determination or in other words, plebiscite of the uh, people of Kashmir. And no situation, no matter what the Indian government says or even the Pakistani government says, would have that kind of legitimacy without the input of the Kashmiri people themselves. And that is the fundamental uh, idea or the fundamental fact on the ground that is ignored by everybody uh, who are uh, at the table. And uh, another thing that also is ignored, the Tashkent Agreement between Pakistan uh, and India uh, right after the war between Pakistan and India over Kashmir, which called for uh, you know, the withdrawal of the uh, armed forces of both Pakistan and India from Kashmir. And again, to have a plebiscite to find out what the people of Kashmir really want. Either they want to join Pakistan or India or be an independent country. None of these uh, uh, agreements or international uh, uh, understandings, with the, uh, including the United Nations and the international community, are taken in account when this uh, blanket statement is made that Kashmir is part of India and we can have um, um, any kind of law or any kind of uh, administrative um, uh, actions on Kashmir as we, uh, which is the Indian government, see fit. Right. So the uh, end of British rule in 1947 uh, sort of was the beginning of the tensions around Kashmir, which is a state of more than 12 million people, about 70 percent of the population Muslim, about 30 percent Hindu and other uh, minorities, but mostly uh, that other the minority is Hindu. Uh, and uh, there has been, as you said, there have been repeated attempts at um, the by the population of Kashmir 
here to uh, protect themselves from the armies of both these very powerful nations. Is this revocation of Article 370 of the Indian Constitution, which is the article that you were referring to, is, the, is Modi's revocation of this article part of his ongoing persecution of Muslims in India as a you know, head of a right-wing Hindu nationalist government? Exactly. Um, as an Indian Muslim um, or uh, a minority in the country of India, we have these issues. We have the issue of Kashmir, um, a political issue, uh, issue of um, you know, implementing international agreements and the persecution of minorities, persecution of the Muslim minority, the Muslim um, or the Christian uh, minority, the lower caste Hindus, and so on. What this government has done, uh, uh, which belongs to a right-wing uh, uh, movement that is over 100 years ago, which includes uh, the assassin of Mahatma Gandhi as one of its followers, has done is merge these issues. And let me try to explain how it has done that. There is a similar article, Article 235A and 370, where uh, people outside of that particular state or that region cannot buy property or own businesses. That in, uh, is currently uh, exists for the state of Himachal Pradesh. That currently exists for the northeastern states. And it is not that Kashmir is the only exception where uh, Indians cannot buy, buy property. So when you see this kind of a discrimination, uh, another example is the state of the princely state of Junagar, which is Hindu majority. And the, uh, the ruler or the sultan of that was Muslim. And he decided at the time partition to join Pakistan. But India did not agree, saying that the population is majority Hindu, so it should join in India. And it was forcibly taken with uh, army action in Junagar, which is currently part of the state of Rajasthan. Hmm. Now, when you see this kind of um, uh, uh, direct uh, uh, discrimination or a uh, different treatment, it gives you an idea of what this Hindu government is going after, which is primarily to turn a secular Indian democracy into a theocracy, a right-wing Hindu theocracy, where every uh, uh, citizen is uh, first class unless he's a non-Hindu, he or she is a non-Hindu. The and, and just to the just to try minority, to the minority. right just to yeah. try to uh, underscore when you say Muslim minority, although Muslims are a minority in India because it's such a large country, we're talking about two hundred million people. They are there are two hundred million Muslims in um, India you know, which is what, two th more than two thirds of the population of the entire United States. We're talking about um, the country with the second largest Muslim population in the world. So even though we're, we, we are, it is a minority within India, the actual numbers um, are a huge, huge number. It's a huge population. Yes, and it's even more mind boggling how such a large population can be uh, delegitim uh, delegitimized, cannot, uh, uh, do not have political representatives, are, are uh, much behind economically, socially, politically than any other minority. And the Satar Committee report of uh, about 15 years ago has confirmed this. And over a period of discrimination, how such a large, such a huge minority has become totally politically powerless. If you see today in the parliament and the state assemblies, Muslims have lowest participation they ever had in history. And this is the kind of uh, delegitimization of an entire population that is going on day in and day out in so many fronts, whether it's social, economic, political, uh, military, police, everything. And this is the kind of steps that are uh, happening in the last 20 to 30 years that lead towards a country that has the Hindu um, right-wing 
uh, ruling class and then has the second class or even the third or probably the fourth class um, of other minorities unless you uh, or the uh, Indian Muslims accept the Hindu supremacy. And we see that Kashmir is a very um, uh, clear example today where you have uh, leaders within the BJP. Uh, these are not party That's workers. That's the ruling not, party, the Bharatiya Janata Party, Modi's party, BJP. Well, mm -hmm. Exactly, the Janata Party, which is the political arm of the Rashtriya Swam Sevak, which is the RSS, which is a more than 100 year old movement, uh, a Hindu right wing movement and the political arm, the BJP and their leadership, including the chief minister, including the chief minister of Haryana has called for Hindu men to go to Kashmir and get married to Kashmiri women and to buy plots there, to start businesses there, to basically change the demographic. So like and a settler it's, it's, colonial it's, mentality, basically. Absolutely. And that's what uh, uh, the repealing of uh, Article 370 and 35A has done. It, it has turned Kashmir overnight into an occupied territory from a semi-autonomous disputed uh, um, region to an occupied land by India with the world's largest density of armed people uh, uh, to the civilian population. I, I think they, they have brought in close to 200,000 more people in addition to the, not people, the armed forces in addition to the 700,000 that are already there for, for such a small um, uh, region. And, and that shows the complete militarization, the uh, appeal to non-Muslims to leave Kashmir, uh, the closing of the borders, uh, not allowing anyone to go in or out, not allowing media to uh, report or even go inside, not allowing even Kashmiris who hold uh, U.S. Uh, nationality, citizenship to leave. These are the kind of um, steps that is so concerning and that points towards more violence and points towards uh, the um, intention of the current government to seal Kashmir and to hide um, uh, their, their agenda, you know, which is to convert our the changed demography of, of Kashmir to completely take away any possible option where the Kashmiris will, the Kashmiri self-determination can be a factor right. in future negotiations. And, and just to give our audience an idea of the density of troops, as you were just referring, which is another reason why the story is so significant, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of troops in a small region. And as a comparison, the U.S. currently has something like um, 10 to 13,000 troops in Afghanistan, a country that it's actively fighting a war in an, in, you know, an entire country. Um, so in this very tiny region of the planet, you have hundreds of thousands of troops. Can you tell me what has been happening in Kashmir since the revocation of Article 370, since um, India sent even more troops there? Understand there's a communications blackout and a curfew, so it may not even be possible for us to know necessarily what's happening inside Kashmir, but from what you can tell, what is the state, um, how have people living in the state been uh, treated and, and how have they been reacting? Absolutely. Um, immediately before the announcements, probably minutes or even hours before the announcement of the repeal of these articles, uh, internet was shut down for the entire region. Uh, you know, phone lines were shut down. Uh, the border was strengthened with more forces. Uh, about 35,000 uh, forces had already entered the state in addition to the 700,000 that are already there. Uh, to basically uh, seal the border. All non-Muslims, uh, especially the Hindus that were there to perform the uh, pilgrimage, the pilgrimage of Amarnath, and they were asked to cut short their pilgr pilgrimage and leave. And uh, th these were some of the steps. And most importantly, the entire leadership of over 100 people were put into house arrest. This is uh, the government leadership of the state of Kashmir. 
Uh, yes, uh, these were the community leadership because there is no real right. elections. There is no, uh, right. so there are organizations, that, um, different organizations who are the leadership. And uh, because of the continuous allegation that Kashmiris are, are disunited, they, they do not have a proper leadership. Uh, we have something called the Hurriyat Conference where all the leadership of Kashmir have come together and have formed a conference to negotiate on behalf of the Kashmiri people. So there is a voice and by curtailing this voice, including the Congress and the other political leadership uh, that were elected by elections conducted by India, uh, so these were um, you know, put on in house arrest as well. And these uh, people could not reach out to their uh, you know, followers. They could not use phones. They could not use internet. They could, they just had to stay in. Uh, so on Sunday, uh, which was the day of Eid, uh, the, the uh, curfew was relaxed uh, just a little bit for uh, the Kashmiris to um, celebrate, which was the most important uh, day in, in the Muslim calendar. Uh, however, the leaders uh, are still under house arrest. Uh, Sayyid Shah Jilani, which is one of the most uh, well-known leader, was actually arrest arrested. He was taken from his home. And uh, this kind of curtailing of the voice of the Kashmiri is is something of very, very profound profound effect on the whole uh, situation. More than uh, the uh, curfews, more than shutting off uh, uh, the internet or the phone calls, and uh, the media, uh, over the past few years, uh, the entire media of the country has become more, has been facing more and more um, uh, pressure from the government, uh, especially those that are independent media. There are very few independent media in the country remaining. And on top of that, no matter what media was in the valley, in the valley of Kashmir, uh, they have been asked to uh, leave. And on Saturday, uh, there was a, a protest by Kashmiris, which was uh, put down uh, with uh, guns and uh, 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 gas, but uh, there, there were no known casualties. And when uh, there was a BBC reporter who actually videotaped the whole uh, protest and the Indian government flatly denied of it ever happening. That shows uh, that the government is confident of covering up whatever happens in the valley. And that is very, very concerning uh, from uh, uh, what's going to happen in the near future. We are very afraid and we are very scared for the people there um, based on, on these actions. By the government. And are journalists being allowed in at all? Are people trying to get information? And presumably there are journalists in Kashmir who are even Kashmiri who might be um, documenting what's happening, may not be able to get their reports out. But what's the state of journalism and reporting from the region? Absolutely none. Um, all uh, what we hear from are from people or journalists or volunteers who are secretly taping or recording or covering uh, what's happening on the ground. And if we have no idea of what's happening on the ground, uh, we just have the, only the official government uh, statements to uh, go by. So uh, the only uh, mainstream or uh, the media that we have seen in the last few days is uh, that report I just mentioned wow. by the BBC. Now, uh, let's talk about the broader international implications of this. Um, the uh, Pakistani government has, of course, reacted with anger and disappointment at what India has done. Um, but, uh, and of course, as I mentioned, both are nuclear armed states. Uh, India and Pakistan have gone to war twice uh, before over tensions in Kashmir. How serious is the potential for a third war, which, of course, is far higher stakes than ever before, given that both are now nuclear armed states. Yes, um, considering uh, the nuclear situation with both uh, Pakistan and India, the situation is no longer how it was in 1971 or uh, 1963 or even 1948. Uh, this war is uh, definitely um, has far more higher stakes. It's not just the nuclear 
uh, uh, ability of both the nations, but also so much time and so much persecution has gone through. And most importantly, the rise of the Hindu right wing government in India. So this is a very important factor. Uh, this government uh, we have seen the last few years can go to any extent to just at least show that they are strong. They can do things. We have seen um, their raids in Pakistan during the elections uh, just to appear um, uh, strong and uh, taking some action. And uh, even though it did not achieve anything, it did um, bring in a lot of uh, political success for the government or for the BJP at that time. Uh, which resulted uh, in a massive uh, uh, electoral victory uh, for the BJP. So th these are the new situa situations that make uh, that future conflict all the more dangerous, all the more long term and far more uh, critical to be uh, resolved than before. One of the important thing for the in international community is the insistence of um, India uh, that it is a bilateral issue or if now as the BJP is mentioning it is an internal issue and not welcoming any type of mediation be it from the United States, United Nations, any other country uh, to uh, resolve this because uh, any kind of negotiation starts with the premise of implementation of uh, agreements that India is already party to, and India does not want to do that. Now, we, we just have a couple of minutes left. I have a couple more questions for you. One is, um, could this situation derail uh, peace developments in Afghanistan because the U.S. has just negotiated or attempted to negotiate a peace deal with the Taliban in Afghanistan, which requires Pakistani participation. But Pakistan has said it needs to move a lot more of its troops potentially to its southern border away from its northern northern border with Afghanistan, which some are suggesting could jeopardize what's happening in Afghanistan. Do you have any information about that? Yes. Yeah. Uh the Taliban has said it has nothing to do uh, or will not get involved in the Kashmir conflict. It is focused in Afghanistan. So that is a kind of good news for the United States and the United States can continue to uh, um, uh, do its, uh, towards its objective of withdrawal from Afghanistan. However, when we see the desperation of Pakistan uh, in, in uh, bringing this issue to a resolution and uh, in, in getting uh, other parties involved, it is likely that Pakistan is going to play the card with the United States uh, that um, to get its cooperation uh, on the uh, Afghan front, it needs some type of help from the United States on the Kashmiri front, on the Eastern front. Right. This is a card that is very much possible that Pakistan and then finally, what about legal challenges to what India has done within India? Um, of course, there, uh, the, those who are not just um, among Muslim lawmakers and or organizations, uh, but even some of the uh, left wing and progressive parties and organizations in India have vowed to fight what Modi has done. Are there legal challenges given that in, in, in doing what he has done, Modi has gone against the Indian constitution. There seems to be a legal case that is to be made here? Yes, there, there are attempts, there are attempts. But as we have seen during the elections, uh, the whole controversy of EVM, which is the electronic voting machine, there have been proven uh, meddling of uh, these machines um, by the government. Uh, many of these cases have gone to the courts. And with that, we see that this government will go any extent, uh, including uh, right before a report going to come out by the Central Bureau of Investigation, which is the internal investigation arm that was investigating a corrupt deal by the government. And overnight, the entire offices were locked down and the entire staff was arrested by the government. Wow. And this happened right under the watch of this government. It happened probably a couple of years ago. So anything can be expected. So the 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 uh, reliance on institutions, institutions of court and uh, of law and order are, uh, is, um, you know, um, uh, as much as we can hope for that it will uh, uh, be strong, but um, we don't think that uh, we, we cannot rely a lot on these things. 
as we have seen, uh, there's a super majority of the uh, party in the parliament, and they are confident they can get this uh, change in constitution going right. as they deal with it. Well, Wakas, I want to thank you so much for joining us today and helping to shed light on these uh, on the situation. Can you give out a website for where people can find out more about the work you do? Absolutely. It's www.icna. Uh, CSJ ICNA Council for Social Justice, and um, uh, we also have a Facebook for uh, the North American Islamic uh, Indian Muslim Association, Naima, uh, facebook.com uh, forward slash indianmuslims.org. We'll, we'll post a link to all of those from our website. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Samali. Waka Sayed is National Coordinator for the North American Indian Muslim Association and the California State Coordinator for ICNA Council for Social Justice. ICNA.org is the website. We've been discussing the situation in Kashmir. I'm Sonali Kolhatkar. We're online at risingupwithsonali.com where you can sign up for our daily newsletter. Do subscribe to our video channel on Vimeo and find our audio podcast on iTunes and now Spotify.